A citadel of learning, learning. A world class institution, institution. Good and disciplined leaders.
impact on human well-being has, been, has seen human population increasing exponentially. With this population growth has come the expansion of economic activities as a precursor to the removal of forests to obtain construction materials. We need the forest for fuel wood, we need the forest for wildlife, we need the forest for aquatic lives, and we need the forest even for cultivation, for agriculture. So the forest is under a very serious onslaught. The situation that I have described above points to the destruction facing natural or environmental systems and their resources. In spite of all these biodiversity resources, if sustainably managed, will still help us to find our trajectory for sustainable development. The margins of the Sustainable Development Goals, which are otherwise known as Agenda 2030 of the United Nations in 2015, further strengthens the hope of wise development, particularly because of the indivisibility and interconnectedness of the 17 goals and their 169 targets. Significantly also, there are direct relationships amongst all the goals and biodiversity resources, confirming that these resources will be key drivers in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. This therefore places tremendous challenge on the academia as massive research, creativity, and innovation on biodiversity resources will be required of all of us. Now we need to frame the issues of the subject of discourse. Biodiversity resources are natural resources which replenish themselves to overcome resource depletion, which is caused, of course, by usage, by consumption, either through biological production or other natural recurring processes in a finite amount of time and human time scale. Biodiversity resources are a part of Earth's natural environment and the largest component of its ecosphere. The positive life cycle assessment is a key indicator of the resources sustainability. Biodiversity, like most other renewable natural resources, are from sources that cannot be diminished. Examples include solar, wind, hydroelectric, biomass, and geothermal, as well as flora, fauna, water. Fossil fuels like coal, oil, and even clean burning natural gas, gold, diamond, and other mineral resources do not exist in unlimited supply. So they don't qualify as biodiversity resources. Someday you will all be gone if you don't manage them very well. In addition to perpetual availability, biodiversity resources create less of negative environmental impact, particularly pollution. They can be described as resources which are capable of being replenished within a lifetime. However, they can also be depleted if not properly managed. There is therefore the need that biodiversity resources are managed in sustainable manners for the present and future generation. That's what sustainable development is all about. Now I have a chart which shows biodiversity and renewable natural resources and the way they can be classified. Of course, we have on the left side the biotic resources and we also have the abiotic resources. Now for the biotic resources, we have the forest. And please don't accuse me for naming the forest first. That's home for all of us. There is no life without forest. Just imagine what the planet Earth would look like if we did not have forest. We also have animals, we have fish, we have uh, other marine organisms. 
And for the abiotic resources, we have water, we have wind, we have biomass, fuel. Now, this classification is very important for us to be able to frame exactly what this discourse is going to be about. These resources that I have highlighted above are globally significant and they contribute to the reduction of poverty and enhanced development. For obvious reasons, our emphasis at this discourse will be more on forest, water, wildlife, fisheries, and marine resources. So we we'll talk about the global distribution of biodiversity resources. And the first that I'm going to talk about is the forest. It covers about 4 million hectares of the world. 31% of the world's total forest is in Asia, followed by 21% in South America, 17% Africa, 17% in North and Central America, 9% in Europe, 5% in Australia. And I have a table which also shows the distribution and structure of the world forest and other woodland. I'm sure you all have the documents, so I don't need to emphasize much on this. But 10 countries with the largest forest area include the Russian Federation. It has about 809 million hectares. Brazil has about 520 million hectares. Canada has about 310 million hectares. The United States has about 304 million hectares. China, 207. Democratic Republic of Congo, 154 million hectares. And I'm going to say one or two words about the Democratic Republic of Congo. It probably has the best and the largest quantities of mineral resources in the world. And that is why the, that country does not do peace. We are going to talk about conflict and natural resources in the course of this discourse. And there is a school of thought that says that if Congo knows peace, then Africa's development will start. Because most of the resources that we need to develop Africa can actually be found in Congo. So all parts of the world together control about 1,347 million hectares of forest. For wildlife, this refers to animal species that have not yet been domesticated. And they can be found in all ecosystems, such as the deserts, forest, rainforest, grassland, and other urban areas. These various ecosystems contain very unique forms of wildlife. The global wildlife population is said to have reduced by 52% between 1970 and 2014. So we are destroying them on a regular basis. Wildlife are very important, though they may be dangerous to man. Their values range from educational to economic. They include wild fowls, buffaloes, tigers, bears, rabbits, squirrels, lions, giraffes, antelopes, gazelles, amongst many others. And they can be kept as pests that serve for sources of tourism. For fish and other marine organisms, these can be described as plants, animals, and organisms that live in salt water or the sea, ocean, or brackish water of the coastal estuaries. 99% of land on earth is supplied by the ocean. Most of life forms that can be found in the marine habitat include fish, amphibians, seals, dolphins, or whales, and algae. Research has shown that there are 230,000 documented marine species, including about 20,000 species of fish. These species vary in size from the microscopic, including plankton and phytoplankton, which can be as small as 0.02 micrometers. And they also have the very huge ones like whales and dolphins, which in the case of blue whale can reach 
up to 33 meters, that is about 109 feet in length. For water, according to the available estimates, the entire water of the earth is around 136 million cubic kilometers. Water is a very vital component of human life, you all know this. Agriculture, which is the largest consumer of water, consumes about 70% of all fresh water withdrawals. And I have some figures which shows the distribution of water, fresh water. We also have uh, another figure which shows the distribution of atmospheric water. You find out of that in the document given to you. The question to ask is, are biodiversity resources truly important? And of course, the obvious answer is that yes, they are very important. But it's important for us to know how important they are, the role they play, so that before we destroy them, we can actually think twice. Those biodiversity resources are very important for the survival and satisfaction of humans and planet. When we view them broadly, the services of biodiversity resources can be categorized as follows. The first one is environmental service functions. The second one is sociocultural services. The third one is scenic and landscape services. And we also have socio-economic services. In the area of environmental service functions, we have hydrological benefits, we have reduced sedimentation rules, we have disaster prevention. We also have biodiversity conservation, we have carbon sequestration and storage, we have them retaining trees on the landscape, and we have landscape beauty as rose played by these biodiversity resources. In the area of social and cultural services, the social and cultural services rules will include cultural and mystic values as reflected in the people's history, religion, art, and other aspects contributing to the functioning of society as a result of their uses. In the area of social and economic services, forest food include wildlife, fiber, and food. Forests and their resources have continued to play major roles in livelihood sustenance among the people of the tropics and indeed globally. Forest serves as a valuable repository of natural foods. The role of forests in our livelihoods may be broadly applied as follows. There are sources of employment and cash income, forest security, sorry, food security and nutrition, fodder and grazing, medicinal uses, and also spiritual uses. Of course, they also contribute to employment and income. Food security, we have fruits and berries that are from forests, and they are probably the best that anybody will want to consume because they do not have health risks. We have those that will give calcium, magnesium, potassium, they are proteins, they are fats, they are starch. We have nuts, oils, and carbohydrates. We have young leaves and herbaceous plants, which will give vitamins, carotene, calcium, iron, and so on and so forth. For fodder and grazing, we all talk about food and cattlemen and the farmer's crisis. It's because we have destroyed our environment. And I'm not going to dwell so much on that. Of course, for medicinal uses, Forest products are becoming very valuable. And I know that the United States of America spends about 50 billion annually on research on these uh, uh, forest products for medicinal purposes. I have mentioned social cultural services. You cannot uh, be crowned a chief or a king if there is no leave. In Yoruba land, we call that leave what? What do we call that leaf in Yoruba land? Akuko, not Akuko, Akuko. That tells you how important it is. Now, energy for domestic and industrial uses. Again, you get them from forests. 
fiber for domestic and industrial uses to get them from the forest. Now, one very important uh, aspect of use of forest to humanity, which most of us ignore, is forest and human settlements. In traditional African societies, trees and forests play, and they are still playing very significant roles in settlement patterns. For example, many settlements started around prominent trees. You hear things like Idi Araba, Araba is a tree. What it means is that without that tree, people would not have settled in that area. You hear things like Idi Ruku, the name of the town, Idi Oshi, Idi Eri, Idi Omo, Idi Anure, Idi Ahe, Isale Abu, Uke Aku, Idi Aba, Uke Ibu, Idi Oru, Imushi, Idi Ishi, and so on and so forth. You have palm root in Lagos. It's because of a tree that is called uh, that name. You have breadfruit. Breadfruit is a tree. Ibadon, Ebaodon, although it's made up of trees. Popular Springs in Atlanta is a tree. So the importance of trees to human settlements cannot be overemphasized. And this will continue, of course, at the end of time. Now, we want to link biodiversity resources and development. And I describe this relationship as the good, the bad, and the ugly. Forest contribution to uh, GDP has continued to decline from over 1.2% in the year 2000 to 0.9% in 2011. This decline has occurred because of the sector um, the sectors of the global economy, especially services, which have expanded rapidly. And I have a figure over there which shows the declining trend uh, in terms of contribution of forests to GDP. And you can read more about that in the document. Now, forest contribution to GDP by region is also indicated in that document. We have different values, different figures for uh, the contribution of forest. And of course, in the area of human satisfaction, I have a pyramid which shows the types of human satisfaction that we all want to be associated with. And the forest plays a role in each of these ones. For my life, I also have the figures. I will not dwell so much on it. Tourism and travels as a percentage of deep, uh, GDP for Sub-Saharan Africa. I have the figures. Uh, in the area of fish and marine organisms, uh, there is tourism, flourishing tourism industry all over the world. Of course, for water, the adequacy of data on contribution of water to GDP can be, however, linked to the investment in safe drinking water and sanitation, which contributes to economic growth. Again, I have the figures in the document. I don't have to belabor that. So I have a table, table four, which shows natural resources and sources of conflict. I talked about that earlier. Wherever you have natural resources, there must be conflict. How that happens is difficult to explain. It's half of resources, in their favor, is always, it is happening already in Nigeria. There will always be the possibility of fragmentation of states because of inability to meet the population's needs. Scarcity of natural resources will also lead to tendency of authoritarianism to suppress protests from the population. This is happening in many parts of Africa. Competition by groups to eke out a living over scarce resources it is happening in Nigeria. Fall in the standard of quality will also manifest this. When you have abundance of natural resources, there's always a tendency to mismanage it, just like we are doing in Nigeria. The possibility of different interest groups imagining to have a stake on abundant natural resources will also happen. It's already happening in Nigeria. Now, the ownership 
of natural resources also need to come from this way. There's always increased tension over ownership of natural resource base. In Niger Delta, we all know what is going on. The distribution of natural resources in itself also creates some conflict. We will always have allegations of unfairness in the distribution of these resources. Management of these natural resources again can be a problem. We also have allegations of sexual policies. This happens in Nigeria. Of course, allocation is always an issue. When natural resources are not allocated equitably, it leads to a uh, problem of access to quality and also environmental issues. So, what are the global interventions that can help us resolve some of the problems that I have tried to raise? In an output of mine in 2014, I raised the issue of what happened in the Rio de Janeiro in 1992, which was the first collective alarm sounded for humanity chart a new course that will engender harmony between development and nature. Since then, other initiatives such as the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which ended in 2018, then Agenda 2030, which started in 2015, which we all know as the SDGs, and of course Agenda 2063, which is Africa's own development agenda, which will outlive the sustainable development goals. All these have come up uh, as a result of concern about the way we have managed our biodiversity, the way we have managed our environment, the way we have managed our natural resources. Now, realizing the animal disparities in development across the globe and the widening gap between the rich and the poor, the United Nations in September 2000 enunciated the Millennium Development Goals, which we called then MDGs to be achieved by 2015. The eight goals were declared officially closed by December 31, 2015, and gave way to the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 goals, which I guess many of us know, and I have a figure which shows these goals. There are also 169 associated targets, which were adopted by member states of the United Nations September 2015. These were ambitious goals, and we believe that it's possible for us to achieve these goals. These goals are expected to engender economic development and unleash uh, social inclusion and also help us in sustainably managing the environment. And they also underpin, unlike other uh, goals in the past, they underpin by good governance. The SDGs expect that they have to be good governance. If you don't have good governance, it is not possible to benefit from the SDGs. The goals and targets are expected to stimulate action over the next 15 years in areas of critical importance for humanity and the planet. The first critical aspect of this goal is the care for people. It wants to end poverty wants to end hunger. In all their forms, hunger has to be eradicated. That is one objective of the goal. Poverty has to be reduced. It may not completely be eradicated, but we can reduce it. And it's also to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality and in healthy environment. The second critical aspect of the goal is the planet itself. The objective is to protect the planet from degradation, including through sustainable consumption and production, sustainably managing its natural resources and taking urgent action on climate change so that it can support the needs of the present and future generations. The third critical aspect of these 17 goals is prosperity, to ensure that all human beings can enjoy prosperous feeling lives and that economic, social and technological progress occurs in harmony. And the fourth P, all of them are P's, people, planet, prosperity, and also peaceful coexistence. 
The fourth P, which is peaceful coexistence, uh, talks about inclusive societies with which are free from fear and violence. There can be no sustainable development without peace. And no peace will occur without sustainable development. So they are in touch with it. The fifth P is partnership. Partnership to mobilize the means required to implement this agenda through a revitalized global partnership for sustainable development. And this is based on the spirit of strengthening global solidarity, which is focused in particular on the need of the poorest and most vulnerable people with participation of all countries, all stakeholders, and all people. Now, according to the UN General Assembly in 2015, the interlinkages and integrated nature of sustainable development goals are of crucial importance in ensuring that the purpose of the new agenda is realized. If we realize our ambitions across the full text of the agenda, the lives of all will profoundly profound improve and our world will be transformed for the better, quote and unquote, by the UN Secretary General. Now, I have the figure of the SDGs, and I know we are all used to it, so there's no point uh, uh, talking more of that. Now, by comparison, the MDGs used 60 globally harmonized indicators, although even this limited number of indicators was not fully implemented and in all countries as of 2015. Data for most MDG indicators still include many missing data points, and some indicators have been reported with a lag of five years or more. Sound metrics and data are therefore critical to turning the SDGs into practical tools for problem solving. First is we need to mobilize government, the academia, civil society, and business to work together on the SDGs. Second is providing a report card to track progress and ensure accountability. Just June 14, I think last week, uh, there was a dashboard that was launched in Kigali for Africa, which reported the progress about uh, the performance of African countries. The, the third one is serving as management tool for the transformation needed to achieve the SDGs by the year 2030. It will therefore take many years before the official SDG indicator framework is underpinned by comprehensive data. We are really lagging behind the area of data for SDGs in our country. For us in Africa, this will require research, collaboration across disciplines, institutions, stakeholders, and across borders. The need for collaborative and transnational development research cannot be overemphasized. We need to work together. Those of us in the academia, civil society group, uh, the private sector organization, government, we all have to work together if we need to achieve uh, the SDGs. So why am I emphasizing much on collaborative and transnational research for the SDGs? Unlike the SDGs, which serve to focus on developing world. The SDGs focus on the entire global community, hence the comprehensiveness of the goals. The indicators and the targets all talk about the group. There is no part of the world that does not need the SDGs. As a matter of fact, the SDGs have brought all of us to the same level. We describe countries as developed or developed or underdeveloped. Now the SDGs have put all of us at the same level. The United States of America that we all think is the best country in the world has its own problem. It has governance problems. It needs the SDGs. It has climate problems. It needs the SDGs. So there is no part of the world that does not need uh, the SDGs for uh, human uh, development. Now, you probably heard in my citation that I head the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is a UN body in Nigeria. We have tried to work with the academia and other civil society groups. And until we find, we have tried to classify the SDGs 
into some research groups. We call them research and development groups. Because these goals are quite similar in some ways, they are indivisible, they are interconnected. So for us, we think SDG 1, SDG 2, SDG 3, and SDG 8 can work together. And we have put all of that under the theme called human well-being and economic development. And we think all disciplines can be involved in this. And we expect that the collaboration will be transnational. In other words, we need the North, by North we need Europe and North America, we need the South, we have to work together. And it will involve low, middle and high income countries in terms of risk. We have also put together SDG 4 and SDG 5. And this is under the theme of education, empowerment, and gender equality. Now, it is also transdisciplinary collaboration. It will involve education, it will involve the social sciences, and it will involve technology. Again, we need the North, we need the South, we need developing countries, we need uh, underdeveloped countries to work together to achieve this goal. Now, the third category is SDG 9, 11, and 12. Now, we have put those under sustainable cities, infrastructure, production, and consumption. And we believe that science, engineering, technology, social sciences, and agriculture will have to go work together to be able to achieve these goals. Now, again, developing and developed countries will have to work together. The fourth category, we put together SDG 6, SDG 7, SDG 13, SDG 14, SDG 15. And all of that is under the theme of environmental health, conservation of natural resources, and climate action. Now we expect people in the sciences, the social sciences, medicine, and public health to work together on this. Again, like the others, South South cooperation is very important here. Because the problems of Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, other African countries are quite similar in this area. So you expect South South cooperation, but at the same time, you expect support from the northern part of the world. The fifth category is uh, the putting together of SDG 10, SDG 16, SDG 17. And we think that social justice, inclusive growth, peace, and partnership. And we think people in the social sciences, education, technology can work together. Again, we need not sound cooperation involving developing and developed countries. Now, several, several models of collaborative and transnational research is comprising interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and multidisciplinary, which can impact the achievement of the SDGs abound. They are all over the place. In 2009, even before the SDG started, Adepipe uh, introduced the kind of model which I also have uh, in the uh, presentation. Now, that model talks about agro food systems as a very important uh, transdisciplinary research uh, agenda. It talks about medical systems. It talked about socioeconomic and sociocultural system. It talks about the environmental system and so on and so forth. The figure is uh, there uh, displayed and you can understand it better in the document. Now, we need to embrace sustainable development goals to achieve friendly and sustainable interaction. These goals, which are otherwise known as Agenda 2030, are a universal call to action to end poverty, to protect the planet, and to ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. The agenda, like I said, consists of 17 indivisible and interconnected goals and 169 targets. We also include new areas such as climate change, reducing inequality, sustainable consumption, peace and justice, among several other priorities. Of particular importance to us in biodiversity and renewable uh, natural resources 
uh, issues in education and research. And we also have goals 12 and 15, which is about land on earth and land, sorry, and uh, underwater. While these mentioned goals speak to environmental issues and sustenance, of importance also are goals 1, 2, and 4, which speak to ending poverty, hunger, and ensuring food security, and uh, also education. Most critical of this is uh, to this discourse, like I said, is goals 14 and goal 15, uh, as contained in the resolutions adopted in the General Assembly of the this September 2015. And I have a table here who talks more about that. But these are actually the issues that deal with biodiversity. And the goal 14 is to conserve and sustainably uh, use the ocean, the sea, the marine, and their resources in a sustainable manner. And there are also targets by 2025, what we expected to achieve, by 2020, what we expected to achieve and so on and so forth. If we want biodiversity and sustainable development goals to work together for our collective development, one of the things we can do is to ensure we have buffer capacity. And this will involve diversity of our livelihood options. Yes, we need biodiversity for our livelihood but we also need to diversify livelihood options. The second one is to raise human capital endowments. The third one is improve rights and access to livelihood resources. The fourth one is improved incomes. The fifth one is enhance site-specific knowledge. We need to have knowledge even about biodiversity. We don't have enough knowledge about it for now. We need policies that serve as incentives tendency towards stewardship rather than exploitation. Right now we're just exploiting these biodiversity resources. We are not accountable. We are not having stewardship for the use of these biodiversity. We need to enhance the environmental benefit. The third thing that I'm recommending is self-organization. Dependence on local resources is very important. Cooperation and networking amongst components of the system. Ownership of resources, degree of dependence on indigenous knowledge and flexibility in decision making. And the third option that will enhance that we are able to achieve sustainable development goals through biodiversity is increasing adaptive capacity. Under these opportunities for knowledge combination promoted by existence of a variety of learning platforms, today we have the social media, we can share knowledge about biodiversity share the about the FTGs as against inciting comments that we share on these platforms. We also need to have functioning feedback and mechanisms, especially among stakeholders. Farmers need to talk to researchers. Extension officers need to talk to other stakeholders. Researchers and policy makers must work together. We need to narrow the power differentials. There is a huge gap between the house and the house law. So we need to narrow this part and refresh There's also the need for reliance on indigenous knowledge. There's a huge indigenous knowledge out there that we are not exploiting. If we want the biodiversity that we have to serve the need of the indigenous, we need to have indigenous knowledge and utilize them in whatever we do. On the product scale, practical steps towards achieving the SDGs through biodiversity resources will involve some critical instruction that will help to salvage nature. This will involve the adoption and investigation of what we call the blue and the green economies. I have extensively dwelt on this in some previous publications in 2014 and 2018 in search for them. The blue economy espouses the same desired outcome of the real plus 20 green economy initiative which are improved human well-being and social equity, while significantly reducing environmental risk and ecological scarcities. And it endorses the same principles of low carbon, resource efficiency, and social inclusion, but it is grounded in the developing world context 
and fashion to reflect the circumstances and needs of different countries whose future resource base is the marine. Fundamental to this approach is the principle of equity, ensuring that developing countries optimize the benefits received from the development of their marine environments such as fisheries agreement, power prospecting, oil and mineral extraction. It should promote national equity, including gender equality, and in particular the generation of inclusive growth and decent jobs for all. At the core of the blue economy is the decoupling of socioeconomic development from environmental degradation. To achieve this, the blue economy approach is founded upon the assessment and the cooperation of the real value of the natural and the blue capital into all aspects of economic activity, that is conceptualization, planning, infrastructure development, trade, travels, renewable natural resources exploitation, energy production and consumption, efficiency and optimization of resource use and paramount while respecting environmental and ecological parameters are also very important. This will include where sustainable, the sourcing of the use of local raw materials and utilizing where feasible blue, low energy options to realize efficiencies and benefits as opposed to business as usual that is the ground scenario of high energy consumption, low employment, industrialized development model. Blue economy uh, recognizes the place of a renewed emphasis on the critical needs of the international community to address effectively the sound management of resources beneath international waters by the further development and refinement of international laws and ocean governance mechanisms. Every country must take its share of the responsibility to protect the high seas and of course uh, the uh, other natural resources. High seas, like I said, cover about 70% of the surface of our oceans and constitute more than 90% of the volume. My concluding remarks. Performance scorecard of Nigeria on the SDGs index and that board is still unacceptable. It averages about 150 out of 156 countries globally, and this was as of 2018. In Africa, Nigeria performed as the 39th out of 21 African countries. 2019 is even worse. Nigeria is 47 out of 52 countries that were assessed. But we did very well in sustainable consumption and also sustainable production. And what this tells us is that the federal government policy on agriculture seems to be working. So we did quite well in that area. But for other goals, we have not done so well. We did quite well in the area of climate action, meaning also that some policies that have been put in place are actually uh, giving good results. So we must try to end poverty and we must ensure access to quality basic services and human rights for all. We must unleash the potential of half of our population by ensuring women's full equality and protection from violence. Successful implementation of the goals will require taking a deeper look at why some things are working and others are not. Often the answers will be structural and we must not shy away from seeking large scale reform. Government and the UN system cannot achieve the SDGs below. All of us must support the SDGs. We need to shape transnational relations so that African countries can reap the full benefits of partnership with various actors and stakeholders uh, and which will be instrumental to the achievement of goals across Africa. Africa is a region, region defined by diversities of geography, climate, culture, ecosystems, and languages, but we are unified by the urgent quest for sustainable development. I challenge the Nigerian academia to be truthful to its assigned goals of research, teaching, and production. 
of solutions initiatives for societal growth and development. We cannot afford to be part of the problems of society, which unfortunately appears to be the case now. Above all, I plead with the academia to return to its true key creed, which is based on academic freedom and culture of accountability, neutrality, openness, decency, transparency, full discourse, evidence through which we can achieve pragmatic atmosphere that will let us uh, attain sustainable development goals. I believe that the SDGs offer us an opportunity to rediscover ourselves in an unprecedented manner that will enable us to recreate a common, prosperous, sustainable present and the future. And the biodiversities of Nigeria are actually enough to serve this purpose of achieving a sustainable development. Thank you for your attention.